Well, fantastic. Great to see all of you. Thank you all for making it, because I know there are two interesting panels we're competing with. But uh, Jeremy, thank you for the plug during the last panel you were on. I know it's very hard to compete with uh, a supermodel and a race car driver. But hell, we got some dynamic personalities here, don't we? A big round of applause to our fantastic panelists. And of course, uh, Jeremy needs no introduction. He is, of course, the activist investor. I was struck by what you said in the last panel about uh, trying to save some animals from concentration camps, a stark image. Of course, uh, next to him. But, well, within the investor world, it's <laughs> That's about right. materiality, within, not morality. All right, well, we'll get into that in a bit. <laughs> I'm just trying to introduce you guys first. And then we've got David Lee, of course, Impossible Foods. Uh, many of you have heard of the Impossible Burger. So he's the entrepreneur who's making this available, bringing it to markets around the world. You know, a, a meatless alternative burger. And he's got some great people investing in his firm. And Beverly Posma, she's the CEO of Harvest Plus. She's the, uh, the person who's going to be innovating the grain and seed industry. She's basically behind super grains, and she'll tell us all about that. And finally, we have Jason Strong, possibly the bravest man on this panel, I've got to say. And I want to give you a big round of applause for being on it, because you represent the meat industry in <laughs> Australia. So welcome, all of you. Now, we know this is a a really important panel because it is crucial. It's about feeding the planet and uh, innovations uh, in technology, in food and agriculture. It's an ambitious goal. We've got seven billion people walking this earth today. In about two decades time, we will have two billion more. That's pushing 10 billion people on earth in two decades. The UN has said in its sustainability development goals that they want to end world hunger by 2030. So these are really ambitious goals. Can they be done? Are there solutions? And this is what I'm hoping to gauge from all of you here. So I've given you all fairly quick intros. I've probably not done you justice in terms of what you really do, which is, of course, very important work. So what are you all doing to address the, the triple burden that we're experiencing of eradicating hunger, uh, food insecurity, and, believe it or not, obesity. So whoever wants to jump in first, quick intros, right at the start. I'll, I'll start. Great, thanks, you David. You put me in the middle, so I'll begin. <laughs> um, well, to feed the planet, you have to have a planet. And candidly, the problem is not just about, as you mentioned, the need to feed the world. The, the issue as well is about the impact that how we're feeding the world today is really limiting our ability to enjoy this, this wonderful planet of ours. Our focus at Impossible Foods uh, is to go hard at the meat eater, uh, to not browbeat people rationally into making better choices, but to make a better product. Mm -hmm. The Impossible Burger is, is you know, eaten by those who love to eat meat. It just so happens that it uses a fraction of the world's resources. It just so happens that at scale, it'll be at or below the cost of commodity product. Um, so our approach is to create a consumer choice, uh, a, create a consumer movement, uh, and to be careful about uh, the, the resources of the planet that we're doing um, to, to make the product we make. Mm. Okay, Beverly? Well, I think I'll start by saying that food is deeply personal. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we're not very good at at reaching conclusions about the way forward because we all have very strong ideas about food. And one of the challenges that we have today is that we have two billion people suffering from malnutrition, not getting enough nutrition, and two billion people suffering from almost too much nutrition, overconsumption. And part of the challenge is this finding a solution is, is so vested in controversy because it's deeply personal. But I think one thing we have agreed is that this can't really wait much longer. The food system is broken, and we're going to have to solve it. And, and one of the things that I find most compelling is that we're a very innovative species. You know, we can innovate our way out of some of these problems with technology. And I was very fortunate to meet a, an economist um, a year ago who has just won the, the Nobel Prize for Food, the World Food Prize, and, and he is doing just that. He's managed to identify that we should break down silos. We shouldn't try and solve poverty, nutrition, and, 
and all the other challenges of food in, in, in three separate places, we should try and find the smallest number of solutions to fix the maximum number of problems. So he developed this idea that we're, we're going about fixing malnutrition all wrong. If we can actually get the plants to do the work rather than supplementing and fortifying food at the other end of the chain, we could solve, we could give farmers more livelihoods, we can make food more nutritious, and we can deliver higher yields, climate smart ag. But we have to put it in one place. So he managed to invent this idea called biofortification actually put the nutrition back into the crops, but make sure they're also high yielding, climate smart, drought tolerant, and pest resistant. And he's done it 150, this is 20 years later, mind you, and, uh, and with lots of funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. $400 million later, we have 150 varieties of staple crops that are ready to go. And we hope to hear a lot more about that later. Jeremy, tell, tell us about the important work you're doing. Well, uh, I just wanted to, you know, we've talked about how we solve hunger and, but, the, the, you know, you, we've got a small audience here in a way because um, factory farming has sort of snuck up on us. And in 1992, 30% of pigs in the US were kept in a factory farm. By 2016, it was over 97%. Over 50% of fish consumed today are factory farmed. And there were 13 billion chickens in 1993. By 2016, there were um, 23 billion chickens at any one time. So, you know, how did it sneak up on us? Because I think we do have enough food to feed 10 billion people right now. Um, but, and factory farming is taking all those cereals. But why did we, I think it is interesting why, why we actually got here rather than looking at confounding points of how we create new varieties or, or, or different animals to feed us. I don't, we had a green revolution in the 50s, funded by foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation, et cetera, all with good intentions. And what we did is we, we had a confluence of discoveries or inventions, such as herbicides, chemical fertilizers, and pesticides which meant the crop yield for cereals went up dramatically. And that all happened in the 40s and 50s, as you know. Um, what happened then was the farmers in the US started uh, going bankrupt because there was an abundance of cereals. What did we do with those cereals? Well, we also discovered uh, antibiotics at the same time, you know, in the 40s. And so what, we, what the farmers decided to do was take animals off ubiquitous pastures eating grass and said, well, with antibiotics, we can put them into cages and feedlots and we can feed them cereals. And that's how we got to that stage. Um, there are really some inconvenient truths about what's happened as a result of that in terms of health. People don't know, in a way, that 80%, 80% of all antibiotics in the US are used on factory farms. It's over 60% worldwide used on factory farms. It's the number one user of fresh water worldwide. It's the number one uh, reason for deforestation, because 85% of soya are used for factory farm. We have to feed these. It's, it's, it's also um, more greenhouse gases than the whole of the transport sector. You know, and these are stats that we, we haven't really put together. We're all talking about climate. We heard you know, Al Gore talk about um, the importance of climate and fossil fuels, and that fossil fuels need to become a stranded asset. There is an argument because Livestock production creates more greenhouse gases than the whole transport sector. And we've got, you know, so how do we wean ourselves off and eat less but better meat? We're the first generation that were eating meat three times a day. And you've got a movement in California, which the rest of the world will follow eventually, <laughs> uh, which is eating less meat. 
and you've got, I'm the largest food tech investor in the world as well by number of companies, and you've got wonderful uh, companies like Impossible Burger creating nutritious, plant-based, plant, I mean, you might want to explain, uh, well, sorry. Yeah, we'll get into that later. Okay, this is our little intro. So sorry, so do. that's my intro. <laughs> that's a wonderful intro. It's slightly depressing, though, to be fair, and we do want to end with a fairly positive note, but we're going to get through these slightly depressing stats first, because as you say, it is disturbing what this industry is doing to the world. But I'll get Jason to have his little um, intro at the start as well, a little bit about what you're doing in your role. Um, <clears throat> that's interesting where you start, isn't it? Um, I want to start with the two billion, I suppose. So there's two billion people that are hungry, two billion that have got too much, but the problem we're talking about is the extra two billion that are going to come along in the next little while. And those stats are actually very relevant to some of the problems that Jeremy's raising. Well, why do we have this massive increase in intensification of agriculture? It's because the demand went up as well. And it's a bit like on one hand, we want to solve this two billion person increase problem, but we actually want to undo the increase in productivity that we've had in the last 30 years. It's like, well, you actually can't solve a problem of having two billion extras if we go backwards. So we're in a situation where we've got to take all the things into consideration as we try and solve the problem about hunger and you know, nutritional requirements going forward. And, and there are going to be decisions we've got to make about how we produce food on an ongoing sustainable, and sustainable being environmental and economically sustainable basis so that we can actually feed, feed the world. Now, a couple of quick questions. Did everybody have lunch? Have had breakfast? Did you have dinner last night? So, so we're not the target market, right? <laughs> I think that's what we've got to be really careful of, that we can, we can be very principled about things and say that you know, we're going to solve the problem for the other people by applying a set of principles that make us feel better. If you're hungry, I'm not sure how excited or unexcited or even interested you are in GMOs. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that we've got to take into consideration as we're solving, solving the problem. I think one of the important things is that um, there's examples in every sector in every part of the world, and in every case where there's a, a challenge and something that we can highlight as being a negative and a problem for us in food production, there's examples of where it's being done properly and better and that we can learn from. And if we, you know, the deforestation one is a good example. And that has been a big, big challenge for the world, the amount of deforestation that's related to cropping production, which has then gone on to animal feeding and, and, and also human feeding as well. You know, the countries that, like Brazil that have got a couple hundred thousand cattle, a couple hundred million cattle they're trying to feed, they've also got a couple hundred million people too. So we've got countries like Australia where we actually export the same amount as, of beef as Brazil and the US does, but we've only got 27 million people and we haven't had any deforestation to produce the cattle or the cereal, but we actually produce less too. We've only got 27 or 8 million uh, cattle too. We don't have 200 million like Brazil or have many, you know, 100 odd million that the US has. So I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn and we've got to find a balance. And it's a, the challenge is a bit like saying, I've got to go 100 kilometres or 60 miles and I've got an hour to do it, but I refuse to drive a car or take a train or use modern transportation because I'm against um, you know, iron ore production and fuel. It's like, well, that's fine, you just can't go. That's a bit like our problem is. You know, we're going to have an extra two billion people. We can feed everybody now. We can better distribute the food we have now. We can manage it much better. We, we've got technology that we can use much better. Right today, we've got technology we can use much better to produce more sustainable, more productive, more efficient food. But we, we can't stop doing stuff. You know, we've got to make sure that we keep an open mind to how we put these things together and how we make a concerted effort for all of us to work together. I actually think... It's, uh, the one thing that everybody has said to me this morning about the panel is, oh, there's going to be some interesting discussion. Sure there is. But the, the biggest um, likelihood is that the four of us, regardless of the difference in the background or the positions we're coming from, are going to be in violent agreement about stuff. And it should be violent agreement about mm -hmm. stuff. It's about how do we have the level of conversation with the level of passion and intensity that's required to put together the collective knowledge to solve the problem that's coming towards us because we've been talking about it for way too long. Mm -hmm. The discussion about having enough food to feed all the people in the world now 
has been going for way too long without it actually being properly solved. And that's just going to get exponentially worse if we don't do something about it in the next little while. Well, thank you all for uh, putting it out there so you know the scale of the problem. And the scale of the problem is enormous, um, you know, the extra two billion mouths that we've got to feed. But the enormity of this industry, the agri-farming industry and the devastation that it's causing the world. I mean, Jeremy, you brought it up, but yeah, who, who wasn't here for Al Gore's speech yesterday morning? I mean, you know, he talked about a sustainability revolution. Are we upon it now? Can we speed it up so that people wake up and listen? You know, 15% of global emissions are due to the agri-farming industry. This is terrifying. So we know that the food system and the way the production is at the moment is fundamentally flawed. So you know, I mean, let's put it out there. Some people want to see the meat industry, factory farming eradicated. I don't know if you're one of those, Jeremy, but uh, is that an answer? Or is it possible, as uh, Jason just suggested there, and as, as well, David and Beverly, to disrupt the industry enough to change it with innovation so that the situation improves? Beverly. I think we have to go up a level. I think one of the challenges is we try to solve the food crisis by only looking at food. And we've talked a lot about leadership. I, I loved the panel at lunchtime. I mean, that was just fabulous. It's how do you follow that? It was great. And Jeremy, I, I really enjoyed your comments. And to pick up on one of your themes earlier that you mentioned, you know, this, this is a challenge that we got wrong as a world. The global community, whilst well-meaning, launched a green revolution to help Africa and Asia with, uh, with almost creating a bigger problem than they were trying to solve. Now, one thing I will say in hindsight, that there are world leaders that are acknowledging that and trying to fix it. And I, I feel we've all been a little bit distracted in the last 12 months about world leadership, but um, there, there are some good world leaders out there right now. And one, two of them are singing from the same hymn sheet. I think for the first time. Sorry, in, who, like, who, who? I'm trying to think the, too. The, <laughs> the two, and maybe they wouldn't be described as world leaders in your world, but they are in my world, in the world of development. And that's the president of the World Bank, um, Mr. Jim Yong Kim, and the president of the African Development Bank, Mr. Akina Deshina. And uniquely and timely, they're both saying the same thing that we've got to fix some of the fundamental problems to fix some of the really big issues of our time, like um, conflict, migration. He's even making links between the lack of development of Africa's gray matter. Children in Africa, a third of children, and here in Indonesia, in, in, in Southeast Asia as well, a third of children are growing up stunted. That's a third of the, the future leaders, the third, third of the, the future leaders of these nations are not able to develop full brain capacity because they're lacking vital nutrients like zinc and iron. And these leaders are saying there's a connection. If we don't allow people to grow to meet their full learning potential, their productivity potential, then we're only going to see persistence of, of crisis, of migration issues, of, of poverty issues. So we've got to start by fixing some of these fundamental building blocks. And, and I'm an optimist. And what I love is that once we've really identified some of these big solutions and we get leaders aligned on fixing the problem, that's when innovation can step up because it fills that that solution space. And, and that's what I love about the fact that in my organization, we've got economists, nutritionists, and agronomists all working in the same space. It creates this healthy tension. I walk past offices with people scribbling algorithms on whiteboards, and they're arguing with each other. But that healthy tension is what the world needs to solve food problems. Because if my nutritionist sets a target to say, we need this wheat plant to reach 120 parts per million of zinc in order to solve this problem, the agronomist, agronomist will say, well, hold on a moment. That, that will take decades to do. It may compromise yields. They negotiate a solution. And then the economist will say, well, there's no point doing that in Thailand. Let's focus on Pakistan, because that's where we can get the biggest return on investment. It, we need the dialogue to break down silos. We need health ministries, agriculture ministries, and finance ministries that actually work together 
to solve this problem, and, and I believe it's possible. But with a lack of good leadership, I mean, you, you cite other leaders there that are also doing crucial things, but with a lack of good leadership, isn't it all down to people like yourselves to disrupt the industry to some degree, to get the investment community on board as well, to invest in what's happening into the sustainability revolution? David? You know, I, I think without creating a consumer movement for choices in food, you know, we talk about food as if it's all about nutritional values and a rational argument. And having spent you know, the longest time in my career at Del Monte Foods running the, the food business there, uh, you, know, you quickly learn that large food companies are not incented to make change and consumers don't want to either, both in developed economies, but frankly, meat from animals is an aspirational good as the world benefits socioeconomically. This is not a problem that is limited to the United States and other developed economies. You begin to realize that in order to make the massive amount of change we need, we need a consumer movement. Um, and we should absolutely hope for greater leadership. We should absolutely improve the mandate from above. But unless we create a better way to consume and make food, I think we're gonna be waiting too long. Um, our view is that uh, market forces and entrepreneurship is a wonderful, wonderful ability to create revolutionary change for the better. And to be clear, uh, we don't believe that ideology has a very significant role to play, despite how emotional the politics of food may be. I, by the way, they hired me as a chief operating officer, and I'm a meat eater, yeah. because I'm the target. Um, and so if someone doesn't serve the world who craves meat, not just you know, wants it for its high you know, iron benefits and its, uh, its, its protein, but crave it, um, I don't think we're going to make enough progress. Uh, and, and that's our focus, create a better product um, through innovation uh, with a very strong capitalist incentive from investors who not just see a world that needs to be improved, but sees a huge economic return for the leaders in technology who are going to do it. Uh, and, and I think we need that, given the disruption required to improve our situation. Thank you. In fact, um, you just brought up a point there, David, because uh, I, I just want to take a, a, a rough poll of the audience here. How many of you are unapologetic meat eaters? Great. Excellent. I'm an apologetic meat eater. I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, you know, I, I think the, this is a good basis to go from because, uh, David, you touched on it, trying to change consumer consciousness to such a degree. But he's not. He's creating a burger that he's tastes creating like a burger. A, a, that won, wins prizes as the best burger in but, New York. But you want to have people in that front door to begin with. So that takes a change in your consciousness mm. you're thinking i want a burger I, I know, it doesn't I have meat I, in it we we've, we've discovered but am uh, i a consumer that's different no 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 i i else. think his burgers bleed the consumer <laughs> he's going to tell us about in it the in the end, end. i want to hear about this technology in the end it's less my point of view um or any of ours it's it's what the consumer wants so it turns out that um the consumer wants a delicious craveable product and they want to feel less guilty about it we talk about the, depress, the depression the world faces around this issue. Frankly, it's because no one actually believes you can have a craveable piece of meat or a delicious um, dairy product without really disliking it. And perhaps there haven't been those options for the consumer. Mm -hmm. But you give a, con you know, when you go into Momofuku or you go into Umami Burger or Bear Burger, one of the chains we've begun to really sell at, the burger is not positioned as the burger to save the world. It may, it may use 95% less land to have no, have no cholesterol, but that is not how you create a consumer movement. You create a consumer movement to say, this is the next great burger, try it. And provocatively named, they want to prove you wrong. Impossible burger? What's so impossible about this burger? They try it, and since half uh, the, the meat eaters we test prefer it blind versus a burger mm. from a cow, mm. they come back to it. So you have to open the door for rational behavior in food. Right. You know, and the door is open through a guttural, emotional, craveable product that, by the way, needs to eventually be cost competitive at commodity scale, which is the other piece that I think we have not yet, until now, thought about in terms of technology. We've thought about precious, organic, GMO-free, locally sourced product that is, um, from a cost standpoint, um, disadvantaged versus the scale of the problem we're seeking to solve. Uh, and I think that's the other element for the consumer. And, Jason, and I need you to come in here because yeah. you're all about the bloody burger, the perfect, you know, 
stake that's on the Barbie. So tell us about that. Go on, stand up not, for yourself. Not all about it. Yeah. Because there's two, there's two other big components to this. So that, because we're talking about solving the hunger problem, right? So that's not what David just described. So someone who goes into a mummy burger and rather than paying 15 US dollars for their prime or choice burger, they're paying $15. Sorry, it is what burger. he described because it takes six kilos of plant protein to get one kilo of meat. Yeah, but then, so, but that's alternative protein, right? So, so you've got a replacement. So you're taking one out and you're putting one in. That uses 95% less land yep. than a quart of the water. I mean, one of the things I would say, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but this I have to mention this. is what I wanted. This, this is a debate with We only launched here. with tastemakers, uh, like you know, David Chang and Tracy Desjardins. We never, we do not intend to be niche or small or premium. The reason why we're starting there is to establish credibility for the product. But I, I hope you'll see us reach global markets at a level of cost competitiveness that has a meaningful impact on hunger, but for us as well, a, a much larger impact on the world and the environment. And that is our goal. I feel like I need to be UN peacemaker on, here, but <laughs> I, I have one no, slide which would play to both of them. If, 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 if our lovely technical team could put up slide six, I think there's a win-win. There really is a win-win. I've just come back from Abuja in Nigeria where I was working with my team on the ground. And what I found particularly striking, I, I come from, one of the most uh, poorest countries in the world to, to one of the wealthiest. And I've had this honor of watching amazing panel sessions. But, you know, humans are humans the world over. My team were talking about the same aspirational things as we all were in this room. They were talking about football over dinner. They were talking about fashion and supermodels. And they were, they were talking about fast cars. So if you strip out the wealth, the consumer wants the same things all over the world. And, and look here at Asia. And this plays to both sides. Asian consumers, regardless of their wealth, two thirds of them are still willing to pay more right now for products that do not contain undesirable ingredients. This is a trend that's worth banking. And 80% of those consumers will buy something with the tag local and natural. So, you know, this is tapping in, we need to tap into consumer trends, regardless of wealth. 42% of Asia's spending power comes from the bottom two thirds of the pyramid. Those that are earning $2 a day actually represent 42% of Asia's spending power. So if we can tap into both solutions, if we can provide cheap and premium, natural, desirable products. We can save the planet and grow our investments. And, and I'm always looking for that win-win. That's a picture of our orange corn, just a little plug. I've got one if everyone wants to see the real thing. This delivers 100% of a child's vitamin A for the day. And it's as high yielding, as drought tolerant, and, and as pest resistant as the leading variety on the market. It's, it's a win-win. Okay. But, but Jason, you were trying to make your point, so we'll let you finish. So there's the, so there's the progression to get to where David's heading at mm -hmm. scale. Right? And, it's got, and it can't be replacing what we're doing now. Because there's this extra two billion people that are lining up. And that this is the problem that we've got to keep in mind that we're trying to solve. So if we give up production activities that we're doing now, we've got to not just replace them, but we've then got to also make the increase in productivity to respond to the growth in the population. That's right, a complete so. confounding point. It's like saying, it's like, it's, I mean, in a way, it's like saying, you know, it's, you're pre representing <laughs> us like, to give an analogy, we want to end slavery. You know, you can't, it's not about that. It's about what, what he's done is a, to end slavery. You, he, I mean, it, probably the washing machine did more to end slavery than than human rights, um, the, you know, making a more efficient farm with more antibiotics, with more greenhouse gases, with you know, creates more issues for the world than than actually providing the source cereals that that we have increased the yield of so greatly that can feed. 10 billion now. This is not about, I'm not against hunting. 
I'm not against eating meat. You know, that, they're all personal choices. They're about the nat whether you believe or not in the natural cycle of life. It's each person's choice. There is a red line with these factory farms that is creating harm for humans, harms for the planet, and harm for investors, hugely for investors. You've got Yum Foods, which is KFC, uh, Pizza Hut, and uh, Taco Bell. You know, it's underperformed the MSCI the last five years, from avian flu epidemics to, to um, rotten meat scandals, JBS. You, you know JBS in Brazil, largest meat producer in the world, collapsed the share price selling rotten, rotten meat. meat. Pardon? Rotten meat. I'm so, just so hold on, we're, but, but, but we're rolling everything up in together. So I, I didn't say anything about more antibiotics and more greenhouse gas emissions. Right. I'm for less of both. I'm for more productivity. I'm for solving the problem of hunger. I'm for applying technology and putting in place the things that we know will improve. So, so I don't what know do, So exactly what, what, what solutions are you suggesting? So, so there's, a whole ra there's a whole range of things. We can do things better now. Right, we can be more efficient. There are, and factory, for example, so factory farms, for example, is is very. So, do you include everything that's intensified in that? So, is it any intensive <laughs> agriculture? So, does it include anything that gets fed grains, or what's included in factory farms? Can I jump in here? I, I think uh, because I, you did place me right in the middle for a reason. I, I think, it, <laughs> as I mentioned, to me, this for us at Impossible, this is not about binary red lines or black lines, and it's not about ideology. Um, it's about a huge consumer need that is getting larger. And it's about using technology and, and making a better product to change it. Productivity for the existing production of animals for consumption uh, in food is fine. The question is, is it sufficient? And, and I think where we may agree is that for the magnitude of the problem we face, uh, all of these solutions, radical ones and more incremental ones, are required. Um, but it, at the very end of the day, the environmental impact, separate from the nutritional crisis we face as a globe, is a bigger problem in, in many ways and a confounding one to the nutritional question over time. Uh, and so our focus is to try to address both. Um, but I, you know, uh, should we get 20% more efficient in our ability to make an animal for consumption? Absolutely. Should we get 20 times more efficient in creating a delicious burger? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and in the end, we're going to have to do both. But by the way, this is a plant-based solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's and, also and, the biotech solution. And you all make amazingly good points. I mean, my issue is that it's so entrenched. The meat farming industry is out there. Billions of dollars are in it at the moment. It's out there doing these unacceptable things that you all list out. So how do we change it? Is there a simple solution to change it? Are there innovations? Can you disrupt how it's operating? Well, so, so Dave was Dave's talking about plant protein. Yes, and you're doing plant uh, uh, protein investment. alternatives. Yes, but there's also biotechnology. Right. So there's, there's brewing. So there's, there's brewing such as um, Perfect Day is, uh, I was stroking Buttercup. Uh, a couple of months ago. Buttercup is um, uh, uh, actually brewing milk. It's the same as brewing it within the cow's udder. You know, why wouldn't you do that? It's more efficient. You know, it's the old adage of- Is it more expensive? It, it, it's more expensive at the moment. Yeah. It, it will be cheaper because it, it, subsidies won't be needed for it, etc. It's the old adage of the, the, which we all know, I mean, well, I'm sure we've all heard it, Ford had asked his customers what they, wanted, they'd want a faster horse. And, um, uh, you know, so that's br brewing. And also there's clean meat. You know, why not grow? We've, we're so advanced in our food tech now. We're, Memphis Meats is growing meat. Tyson's, which is the largest food distributor in the world, or something like that. Largest protein producer, yeah. Is, is, is now suddenly, did they invest in yourselves? Or no, no, we, who, they have not. Uh, that Tyson, Tyson invested in, in uh, Memphis Meat, Beyond, 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 Beyond Meat, the other guy, Beyond Meat. Um, but but growing Memphis Meats is is growing clean meat, and so there are other solutions that are coming through now. We had the Green Revolution in the 60s, 50s, and 60s, 
we've now got a food tech revolution which is coming, which is here. Um, you, Impossible Burger, which is a delicious burger and won prizes as the best burgers in New York. They were just telling me they are scaling up now. Yeah, I think one, one of the opportunities for these... Which as an investor sounds great. I'm, I'm sure that you're very pleased to hear that. Um, one of the challenges for food tech, though, to, to solve the issues and the magnitude we have is, is this focus on scale. And, and like any frothy, um, popular area of venture investment in technology, there's a natural hubris for young entrepreneurs to enter a space like food uh, with a, a desire to disrupt and seek profit and not appreciate that food is a very mature and challenging industry. It is a heavy capex industry. It has safety standards that go way beyond uh, other products. Uh, and, and there is real distribution and supply chain to manage. So it'll be interesting for us to all see how this industry, this food tech industry that I obviously am a part of, how it takes on mature company issues um, as it seeks to disrupt them, the, the, the large industries, uh, over time. Now, I've realized we've only got about 25 minutes. I want to spend 10 minutes with questions to the audience. So let's move on. It's been slightly heated engagement and debate there, but we knew this was going to happen. So thank you for all of you. Who've, uh, who've, uh, let's look into the investments, because that's really the key thing, isn't it? And I know that's something you're doing, uh, Jeremy, as, uh, as an activist investor. I mean, and also, uh, David, I mean, you've, you've had Tomasek, uh, you know, invest. Um, Harvest Plus has got you know, funding from the Bill, Mc, Mill, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for instance. So, so things are happening in the industry to get support from the investment community. So in your experience, how difficult has that been, or how easy has that been yeah. to get all of these foods onto your dinner plate? Well, it, so if I can switch it for a minute, uh, if, what has shocked me, so I've been only doing this for about two years, just under two years, but what has shocked me <laughs> has been the momentum that we've been able to achieve. Pension plans are now saying, um, what's the point of um, having a pension in 2050 if, if, if the temperature is 120 degrees? They're saying, if we build a textile factory in Bangladesh, for instance, we need to have a fire exit and foundations for that factory because it's good business. Nothing to do with human rights. This is about fiduciary responsibility. And there's this wave that has been created. Yeah, I think Principles for Responsible Investment is 10 years old and has, uh, last year, and has around 65 trillion, half the world's investable capital, as a hub to discuss these types of questions. It's making fossil fuels um, a stranded asset. And um, so what surprised me is we've, so we got 2.4 trillion of assets under management mm. um, last April. To write, we wrote to 10 restaurant chains like McDonald's, et cetera, asking them um, what are they doing about antibiotics in the food supply chain. We are becoming resistant to antibiotics. We only discovered it 60-odd uh, years ago with, with the warning not to overuse it. And you know we, we, we all blame ourselves about our hospitals, et cetera. But of course, it's being transferred from animals to humans. We're doing some work at the moment to quantify that. It's like smoking in the 50s. We also got um, 2.3 trillion to write to Unilever and uh, uh, 16 big food companies, asking them what are they doing about protein diversification you know, because of climate change. And it's amazing. What's, what's amazed me um, is one, that people haven't laughed. I, I was expecting, to, when I started on this journey, that it, CIOs around the world would laugh. It's amazed me that they get it. If 80% of antibiotics are used, on, uh, are, 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 are used in factory farms in the US, that is a problem. That's a problem for their fat. It's very personal then, mm -hmm. we were talking about, for, in a different way. You know, if we are, if climate is on the, on the UN agenda, it's on our agenda now. You know, we've seen terrible, you know, we don't know if it's directly related to hurricanes, et cetera, but, um, um, but it's, it's, we're very aware of it now. And so, 
just put it, it, all these risks are like hidden in plain sight. We don't really um, know the facts because it's of sneaking up on us. And this food tech revolution, which people like, group companies like Impossible Burger, just to push them again. Um, oh, plus. Plus. Well. Plus. No, we have not pushed it hard enough yet, so. <laughs> uh, which tastes delicious. And you well, let's, let's, that's, that's fantastic. So, so obviously people yeah. are on board yeah, and there's investment okay. out there. Right. They're not laughing it off. Let's talk about these innovations now, because I know we've heard about biofortification in these seeds. Mm. Uh, you know, you've got heme, I believe, which acts like hemoglobin, but it's actually blood, but it's actually plant compounds, you know. So tell us a little bit about this. And Jeremy, you've put a lot of money into protein alternatives, which include things like bugs. So, I mean, I'd love to hear more about it. Yeah, no, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> I haven't put it into bugs. But, you know, that's an idea. But that people are talking about local protein. They are protein, talking about so, uh, grinding absolutely. down grasshoppers into a powder, making crisps out of them. I mean, these yeah. are all alternatives that are out there that may potentially coexist with the meat industry as consumers around the world change their, their consciousness. And flies. And, and with the sustain, you know, sustainability revolution that Al Gore talked about. So, so let's, let's hear about these innovations. I'm really curious about them. Well, I mean, one of the things that links your question on innovation to your early question on investment is I think in food tech, there's a recognition of the, of the opportunity, the problem to be solved, and there's a recognition of technology being able to solve it. But it's early days on seeing food tech companies demonstrate they can get to scale at the right cost, to be clear. Mm. And, and that, is, you know, that is the challenge ahead of all of us who are seeking to do this. If one does not have, however, as a predicate technology, um, it's game over. And so for us, our technology, which you mentioned is heme, is, is frankly to find the reason why meat is craveable. And it turns out this thing called heme, which is found in animals, is actually found in everything. It's found in mm. plants. And unbelievably, no one had really uh, explored the fact that heme is, is we believe, uh, when you cook heme, with uh, protein and sugars, it uniquely creates the aromatics that derive taste the for the eater. Yes. Yeah, the, we want to try one the of these burgers now. And you didn't bring yeah. enough for everyone, did you? I'm no. sad to say that I did not. Um, <laughs> give, give me a little more time. Um, so for us, it's about what technology allows you to scale across chicken, fish, and dairy that will make your product you know, craveable so that the consumer movement takes care of part of your scalability issue. Did Temasek invest? They just did. Temasek did, and, and I think you know, Temasek thought. and others are attracted to any company, forget about whether it's Impossible or, or any other one, um, by unique ownable technology that can fulfill a consumer need. Uh, and by the way, now the consumer wants it. If we had created this 10 years ago, I wonder how much investment we would gain, I wonder you how much traction we would have had. So there's a ripeness uh, from a consumer. In terms of dairy, 10 years ago, it was less than 1% that of volume sold was milk alternatives. Today, it's 10% yeah. of all milk sold is alternative milk. Today, it's less than 40 times less is sold of meat alternatives. It's less than a quarter of a percent. There is a long way to go, and it is going to grow dramatic. It's a huge opportunity, mm. even just to get to the 10%. Agritech is, is, I think, the second largest <laughs> rising um, investment opportunity in Asia right now. And that's because it's solving multiple problems. And I think, again, it's this multiple solution thing. I don't know the first thing about investment. I, I'm probably at the wrong conference. But I do know about food, and I do know about agriculture. And I stepped out of big food last year to, to try and solve a, a bigger problem. And what I've seen in the investor landscape in the organization that I'm exposed to is that people are experimenting. The MacArthur Foundation, a very big philanthropic organization based in, in Chicago, has just laid down a competition. They, last year, they announced a competition that they would give $100 million to a single idea that was scalable, that could both be investable and, 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 solve, <laughs> right. and solve a big problem. Um, we're very fortunate. Out of 2,000 applicants, we're, we're, we're shortlisted into the final. And we're, right. when will we're you know you've it's, won? Uh, it's all a bit uh, yeah, up in the air. We, we should know by December the final is the, very, the number Good one enough. winner. But it's, I think it's those brave investments Maybe you know you could claim that there are other reasons why they're doing this, but I think it takes quite courage 
to set new boundaries in investment at the philanthropic level. And what that does is then stimulate interest in the economic space as well. And the size of the prize is huge. I, was, I enjoyed the triple bottom line panel yesterday where we saw Kimberly Clark and Unilever talking about mm -hmm. their, um, their leadership in, in chasing the triple bottom line. And what I found, what struck me in FMCG and fast moving consumer goods, you've got to have a short term investment payback, but you've also got to have a long term vision. And sustainability has to be both. If you want an investor to buy into something sustainable, they can't wait 20 years to see the result in climate change. There has to be a short term win like a burger at, at the day. So I think it's about doing both. It's about having a short term quick win that the consumer of today will buy into. But it's also about looking for that bigger price. And I hate to keep coming back to malnutrition, but that's the space I'm in. The, the world, it's estimated that $3.5 trillion is lost from the world's economy because of malnutrition. And that's because of two things. People aren't growing up to earn their full potential, and so productivity is compromised. And we have these huge burdens on government health um, health uh, budget. So someone has to pay for that, and it's probably you guys that are earning way too much, uh, having to be taxed for that. But ultimately, the the economics, the, there is a there is. If we can look for the best return on investment, where's the best buys? And I'm going to plug biofortification again. Yes. But the the World Bank has estimated it offers a one to seventeen dollar return on investment for every one dollar spent on biofortifying a high yielding crop, you're gonna return $17 to the public purse. Now that's got to be good for a business that requires a thriving economy in order to grow. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's both short term, we have, to t we have to respond to what the consumer wants today, and long term, we've got to fix some of these bigger problems. Is there something like biofortification or rather the alternative happening in the meat industry? I mean, is, is this um, a way that you can potentially disrupt it as well from within? Yeah, maybe. And I, I guess I'm trying to find the balance here between how much of the fight do I pick right at the moment. Oh, go on. And, uh, and I think the, the investment topic is actually the right one to be having at the moment, because I think what we're seeing, and, and I think what the guys are, are accurately representing, and quite fairly, is this is a real challenge between an immediate need for acceptance and enthusiasm behind concepts and investment and actually solving the problem. Because we actually don't know that... So am I correct you for a moment in the sense that what you're saying is immediate need? I think what you really mean is a, an immediate want, which is different to a need. So a want is you want to eat fish. Let's say. No, I'm not talking no. about that. I'm, not talk I'm talking about the, the, the need at the moment. We're saying we want to solve a problem of having an extra two billion people. So we're going to focus on investment in protein alternatives, for example. It's like, and I can understand that, and I can understand the excitement behind that, and I can understand how that resonates with people because we have Al Gore speak yesterday and all these things line up. But I, I still think that's wrong because we've solved the problem of you know, all protein comes from plants in the first place. We've solved that issue. What, what we're solving, what, what Impossible Burger is solving for is, is the want of, of the taste and, and not the, the, you know, we already have had the solution of feeding another two billion. There's an aspiration for, you know, you, someone, you said before it's okay for us in the West or, to, you know, the rich countries. To, but if it's, it, you know, it's a bit like telephony. You know, we've got all this wired up um, countries. That Africa has leapfrogged us and gone straight for Wi-Fi and uh, and mobile and cell. Um, it's the why should we've got a you were talking about obesity, diabetes, cancer, avian flu epidemics. Why? go into those mistakes if the rich and powerful don't lead the way, like California. See, that sounds to me like an argument to invest in the company. I haven't said any of those things. I'm not promoting any of those things as, as the solution. What I'm saying is that 
We've got to have everything on the table. The new investments are awesome and we've got to get behind those things. We've also got to make what we currently do better. And there's opportunity but to make what, what do we mean, currently do what better. What do you mean by so that? So ap apply technology that's already available. Take on a different approach to how we actually produce and distribute food around the world and do it better. Absolutely. So greenhouse gas emissions come up. So we talk about factory farm, we talk about beef or sheep meat or pork or swine or poultry production, whatever it might be. The difference between greenhouse gas emissions from a kilo of lamb produced in Wales compared to a kilo of lamb produced in New Zealand, what do you think the quantum difference between those two is? Is it the same? Is it two times different? Is it three times different? The one from New Zealand goes on a ship, gets trucked, uh, shipped for 30 days to, to the UK. Do you think it's the same or is it more or less? More for Wales, more for New Zealand? Three times more in Wales. But there's tariff rate quotas in place that stop the European consumer actually buying more lamb from New Zealand if they want to. All right. So we've got examples around the world where, do you get the cash flow, the oils ain't oils? These things are not the same. We're lumping all of production up together and saying a kilo of meat, whatever it is here, is the same as a kilo of meat. It's really not. A kilo of poultry is not the same as a kilo of beef. It's not the same as a kilo of of land. A kilo of beef produced in Australia has no impact whatsoever on deforestation and soybean production. A kilo of beef in Brazil probably does. Some of it doesn't, but it probably does. I, Jason, so, I, I, so these I things see aren't your, the same. I see your point. So, I, I think the only argument, though, against incremental change of the majority of an incumbent industry is much more successful radical change from those who are new to the industry. It can be both, to your point, but if one solution makes 20 times the progress versus the other, there is a fair debate we should have about where do you place your resource and bets. I totally agree, though, with you on there is huge opportunity within the industry of animal farming today to do better, but I think the debate we're really having is where should we, as investors and entrepreneurs and as a society, place our bets massive progress against a riskier new set of technologies, and or incremental progress with an industry that some of us view as really not sustainable sooner rather than later. So it's, That's the it's debate. Got, it's got to be and. It's, it's got to be and. It can't be yours. So we were violently agreeing industry. as you prophesied. So it's got to be and. And, and just back to, to Bob's point before about the um, requirements for zinc and iron in malnutrition, right? So that's the, the zinc and iron are two of the major requirements from um, young children from a malnutrition point of view. Yeah, do you want to things? just whiz up slide? So going to support the beef industry. We've today. only got five minutes. Slide yeah. two, so, yeah. slide two. Make it quick. So <laughs> try to we talk up. about eating red meat proteins, yeah. right? And we say red meat proteins are a problem because we eat them three times a day. Three times a week, small amounts of red meat protein give you all, amount, all the protein, zinc and iron that you will need. So th there's, a, there's an end that allows us to get a solution started tomorrow and get the solution for the future as well. Do what we're doing now much, much better. Not, not incremental, not stuff around the edges. Let's try and make it much better mm -hmm. while we're doing the other stuff which is really cool. And let's get that going as well. There's another two billion. No, it's not just solving what we're doing now, because we've got a big problem we want to solve now too. But let's help start solving that now and invest in the other stuff at the same time. Don't make this an either or. Don't make an investment in David's company the best thing you can do because you don't like what somebody else does. Do it because it's a, one of the best things you can do for finding a long-term solution for the world and, and hunger. Thank you. That is a very nice note to end on. I'm glad we've... Uh gotten rid of the slight discomfort this but that's the great thing about this panel it was great wasn't it so five minutes um i want to open it up to the audience there's a lot of crucial questions great uh, question right there uh hi uh thank you very much uh this is a really great panel i think one of the best panels of the uh of the conference yay um <clears throat> thank you tweet that <laughs> tweet it uh, <laughs> <laughs> um i think I, can, I cannot emphasize Jeremy's point enough that you can just take a small fraction of the plants and the plant-based foods that are fed to animals today and solve that two billion person world hunger problem. Um, I think that, just on my, I'm just trying to make a point, but the, um, 
in Asia, we have this unique demographic dividend, right? We have the greatest number of people. We all heard the statistics. We have the greatest young, number of young people in the world um, between India, China, and other, uh, other places like Singapore. Um, a lot of this and a lot of, product, uh, a lot of things like uh, the products that Beyond Meat and Possible Foods and others are doing, a big part of this is shifting the consumer's awareness that these products exist because you know, I, I don't know of any plants that we can eat that are listed as type one carcinogens <coughs> along with cigarettes, but red, processed red meat is. Um, and cancer is a big problem. And when we have all of these people becoming older, giving them immunotherapies and cancer drugs is not really the solution. The prevention and the education and the awareness that we need to really reinforce with young people today, I think that's what's gonna yeah. create a sustainable we need planet your for us. Um, Everything you yeah, say makes sense. Um, no, so I just, I, I wanted to just ask, I mean, in terms of, you know, building a consumer movement, what do you think are some of the other attributes or uh, things that some, you know, that we all could do in terms of uh, building a great consumer movement around this? Sorry. What, I thought the question was, did you know a type one carcinogen? Sure, a plant, it's tobacco. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not being smart, I'm not being smart, all right? You say, you say, I'm gonna take a very small component of the red meat bit, which is the further process bit that's treated this way, and I'm gonna classify everything the same. You can't do that. Sorry, your question was type one though, right? So now, so now red meat, regular well, red meat. So if you spread all the information in, it's a different question. Isn't we it? have three right? minutes. So. These are technicalities. Can I give That's you a can I question. give you a thirty second answer and then Bev, please jump in. Please jump in. I think we could have um, another whole hour for this. There isn't question. enough investment, even in food tech, uh, in how do you build a consumer movement. So much is in the product, which is common in many VC backed industries, where if we if you build a better thing, they will come. Um, we struggled with this question. The short answer for us was to learn from the consumer rather than hypothesize. So we took every shred of product uh, very early on and we put it in the hands of 400 mediators across four cities. Um, and we used a form of, of conjoint testing. And so for entrepreneurs who are thinking about this consumer movement question, the fact is you have to have world-class data to answer this question. Our belief for uniquely the US consumer of burgers is that the credibility of others who are tastemakers influence the largest, largest consumption target, which happens to be millennials. And that social media in a community viral setting of, hey, I just tried this crazy thing at Chef's Joint that I love and my friends like, is what for us created the ability to go from one chef to you know, 44 locations to several hundred in the next year. But that's, that's unique to the US, to the US burger market, for the millennial, which happens to be the, the, the consumption and the influencer target, and it all just came from data and testing. I'll answer your question, but add one word. Because I think it's not just about building a consumer movement, it's building a responsible consumer movement. And it starts with the investor. You know, it, I, I think that I've been told that biofortification is poised right where or get the organics movement was back in, uh, in the 90s. Now, organics, the word organic was actually invented in 1940. But suddenly in the 90s, a mass communication campaign led to an overnight race to the bottom. <laughs> and uh, you could argue that from, from an investment potential, organics was tremendously successful as a movement. I think it's worth something like $14.1 billion as, an, as, a, as a, global, a global investment portfolio. But did it solve the problem? Did it actually stay true to its mission and reduce pesticide use? The answer is probably no, although the, the debate is open. What I'm, what I'm saying, though, is that if you put in place some responsible investment before that the market takes over and it's a race to the bottom, it is possible to have a win-win. I believe in biofortification. If we learn from organics and we put in place a global responsible platform that sets some standards, it doesn't wait 15 years for the regulation to catch up and protect the consumer. You actually get investors, not the companies, investors to set the standards. What's our platform of responsibility? We'll say what's biofortified and what's not biofortified because it's our money. And then you allow the market to take over and then you have a successful consumer campaign. That, that would be, but the word responsible is the only way we're really going to avoid this two billion at one end and two billion at the other end. And that starts yeah. with the investor. I was hoping we could end it on an optimistic note. I'm gonna take one more very quick question just because I think all of you have been a great audience. You've all sat riveted. Um, one more quick question. No? There. Going, go on. Yes, there. 
Thank you. Yes, sorry. Um, thank you, panelists, for sharing. It's great, great, great panel. One of the best. Um, could I just ask you guys, if you were to just to end up one sentence, how are you going to give that tagline of educating your consumers? Just that one tagline yeah, for us to take to go. consumer consciousness. Thank you. How do you do it? Uh, I'm bridging the knowledge gap with investors. Good one sentence. Be provocative. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I've got one word. F-A-I-R-R dot org. Farm animal investment risk and reward dot org. Yeah. I think for us, it's as simple as provoke or be provocative because the consumer already is looking for your product. I think it's all about feeding the planet, not just feeding our bellies. Let's think for our children's planet and actually come up with some wise solutions that do both. So, so sadly, so much of the feedback we get about what we should do is forgotten when a consumer gets the purchase decision. I think we can get all of these things over the line if we can have a communication about it being safe, sustainable and good. I can eat it, it's going to be good for my family and I'm going to feel better about doing it. Thank you all. So feeding the planet, can we do it? Are there technologies available? Will there need to be a huge shift in consumer consciousness to bring it about? Technologies, investments, there's lots out there. I hope this left you with plenty of food for thought. Thank you all for being a wonderful audience and another big round to our amazing panelists. Thank you.